So you're curious about the planning process for a geodome glamping site. Well, today I'm gonna to break down exactly what the process was for me and my partner and how we got our glamping dome up and ready to go and officially on Airbnb legally. I think that's the key piece. <laughs> if you don't know who I am, my name is Whitney Hansen. I'm a financial coach and host of the Money Nerds podcast, and I'm also an Airbnb dabbler. I like to play in the unique space where it's really quirky, different properties. That's kind of my style. And I find that those are actually more recession proof. So that tends to be my MO. So let me break down first and foremost, the planning process of the dome. I'm gonna be sharing a lot more details in upcoming videos of how we were able to build this, um, exact costs, all of that kind of stuff, revenue and expense breakdowns, like all of that will be in future videos. But let me first talk about the planning phase. I think this is one of the most critical phases of your entire project. And there's a few different factors to go through. First, you're gonna wanna set a budget and get your financing in order. That is one of the make or break pieces to these types of projects. They're not easy to finance, but there are some ways to find money. The second is being able to run a basic projection to see, does the PNL make sense? Are you actually gonna make money? Will this be a good investment? At the end of the day, these are really cool projects, but they are cash intensive and they do need to make sense from an ROI standpoint. So I will show you exactly the spreadsheet I use, how I plug in some numbers, what I look for when I go on to these different websites to see the occupancy rate, the average nightly rate, like all of that stuff I'm gonna break down in this video. So definitely make sure you watch all the way till the end. Which reminds me, if you enjoy these types of content, please give me a thumbs up. It really lets me know what types of content you like to see so I can create more of this stuff on my channel. Okay, so when you go to set your budget, I think it's really important to understand what the budget needs to be and that can be drastically different. Our site is very primitive. It's much more of a camping site. So the expenses behind that are different. It doesn't have running water. It doesn't have electricity. We are 100% off the grid. So because it's off the grid, we are able to save a little bit of money on the project. So we budgeted $50,000 for our geodome build, not including the land. And if you're wondering how the heck do you finance this, you have basically six options. The first is having a lot of cash. This is probably the least sexy, but probably the best way to go from a glamping site perspective because you have more control over the process and you don't have to make payments every month which would completely eat away a lot of your profit. The second option is a construction loan. Sometimes local credit unions or banks will give you the money to purchase the land and do some development. I find that because these are not necessarily structures where you can just go get an appraisal. It's not like a traditional three bed, two bath house. So because of that, it tends to be a little bit harder to get financing for, for the build itself, and especially where it's a temporary structure. But I'm not saying that's impossible. You just have to do a lot more digging and see what you can find. Some companies out there will do it if it's a commercial business loan, but again, it depends. So a construction loan will at least help you get possibly the lot and maybe even some of the development. The third option is a personal loan. Personal loans tend to be very high interest. They tend to be a little bit more short term. I don't necessarily think I would lean on that, but it is an option for financing. The fourth option is a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit. You can go either way. This is tapping into the existing equity in your current asset, your primary home, and using that and leveraging that to get into the glamping site or buy a piece of property. There's lots of different ways you can do that, but home equity loans do tend to be a popular option. Another option that I don't think is talked about nearly enough is owner carry financing. Now this is more for the lot. And what this would look like is this would be you approaching the seller directly and saying, hey, would you be interested in doing uh, a carry on this? I will pay you monthly payments. And if I don't make a payment, you get to keep the lot and all the money that I paid you. And so it tends to be a bit of a win-win for a lot of people if they're looking for cash flow. The way to set that up would be through a title company. It's a great way to go. It doesn't actually go on your personal credit, which is kind of interesting. So if that's important to you too, owner carry financing might be a good option. Just be careful and make sure you have an attorney look over all of your documents if you decide to go that route. And the last option is more for people that are just getting started or dabbling with the idea, but don't necessarily have the money or the means to purchase the land. And that is to partner with somebody who already has land and what you would be doing is leasing the land from them. So it's basically just a rental. Now this is really common in like farmland. You see this a lot where people will lease out their farmland to a farmer. They pay a set amount per acre it's pretty good. So there's lots of ways you can structure that, but that is a really great way to get started. If you don't have a ton of money and you're just a little bit confused on what your next steps might be, 
that could get you in the door a little bit faster. Again, have an attorney look over documentation to make sure that your agreements are legit and above board and you're not getting ripped off in the process. So once you get your financing in order, you are ready to move on to the next step of the planning process, which is running the numbers. I am a numbers girl through and through. This is the part that will make or break a deal. And so many people dive into this because they see YouTube videos and they see properties that are making millions of dollars a year or 500,000. And it's not necessarily realistic. You have to run the numbers for your own specific area and your idea to see if it's truly a good investment. Again, this is a financial decision. At the end of the day, if you're renting something to make a profit, you've got to make sure that the ROI is there and you don't get caught up into this Airbnb hype where it just feels like a money grab sometimes. So let's go ahead and do a quick screen share and I'm going to show you exactly what I look for in a property starting with Air DNA. All right, so first and foremost, we are on Air DNA. This is where I like to spend a lot of my time just doing some research and seeing what is normal for a specific area. So I went ahead and typed in a city that's kind of close to Boise where I live. This is not where the dome is, but it's a mountain town and it gives you kind of an idea of what I would possibly be looking for. So I typed in Idaho City. Over here, you'll see this rental demand. The higher the number, the more demand. If this number isn't high, it's not a deal breaker for me, but it is something that I do actively look at. The next thing that I look at is this ADR, the average daily rate. How much on average are people charging for this, their Airbnb or Verbo? This includes both of these in this platform, so it is important to understand that too. And it will also include things like a tiny house up to a mansion. So the average daily rate can be a little bit skewed. Ultimately, I don't care too much about that because unique properties kind of warrant their own price tag. They're a little bit different. The next piece that I look at is this occupancy rate. The occupancy rate is so key because this tells you as a whole, how often is this place rented in this market? So if you have a, a normal 30 day month and it's a 70% occupancy, what that means is 21 days of the month are going to be rented on average. And so that's really good for planning purposes to understand what you're getting yourself into. And that occupancy rate is so key. Now the revenue, I don't pay super close attention to this because the revenue is very skewed. In Airbnb, revenue also includes clean, cleaning fees. And so that isn't an accurate depiction of what the revenue might be. From there, if you like, you can actually go in and you can click on these little dots and it will show you the different houses in the area. I like to do this because I like to see like what are the typical styles, are people enjoying it? Um, that's what I like to see as well. And then of course this like rental growth chart will tell you as a whole, is this place growing? Is it going backwards? What's the situation there? You can also see the common amenities. That's moderately important. I think anytime you have a hot tub or a sauna, you're probably going to be okay. But notice that in this area, there are no properties with a hot tub. Opportunities, right? So that's something that you could possibly be looking for as well. But again, the most important piece here is this occupancy rate. I like to see on average, how often are these places booked? Once I have an idea of that, I will pop over to Airbnb and I will search for similar properties. So for domes, I like to look at yurts and I like to look at the domes category. And so what I'm looking for is if you're gonna go for a mountain climate, you wanna find domes that are in mountain climates. I'm not gonna be looking in Joshua Tree because it's such a different market and it's a different experience. And so I like to find a general average of what's normal for a specific area given a similar climate. So what I do first is I go to the domes category and I just do a quick scroll. I like to see what are the average nightly rates in this area. So I'm seeing that's not the right kind of dome. 194, not the right kind. 194, 113, 239, 249. So I'm starting to just get an idea of what's the scope and the landscape of the nightly rate that I'm seeing. And then what I'll do is I'll click on a couple different domes that are possibly similar. So I'm gonna go up because I saw one that was in Montana. Montana's close to Idaho, so this is one that I would look at. I, of course, look at the photos. I like to check out the place. What do they have? What's great? Maybe what's um, areas that I could make a little bit different or unique. I never copy people's layouts. They're 
their ideas. I just think that's so scammy. I like to have a little bit more creativity there. And so I, I will never copy somebody blatantly. I think that's just such a, a shady thing to do, but it can at least inspire ideas of like what you might want to do. So from here, I'll start to look at the check-in. So I'll just pretend book some dates. And what this shows me is that this specific place is not necessarily booking out far in advance. It's not a deal breaker. It's very likely it's a new listing. So that could definitely make sense on why we're seeing that. The other piece that I like to look at is the cleaning fee. That's a actually very reasonable cleaning fee. I like to read through the listings to see, is there any unique features? Is it kind of a different property? What do I need to look out for? And then down below here with the listings, I like to show all of the reviews and I scroll down a ways to see when did this place officially launch and how have they been doing as a whole? And so it looks like it launched in 2021 and people seem to enjoy it. They claim it's the tits. So they like it. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good listing. People are pretty happy about it. Once I look at one, then I'll pop over and I'll pick another one. And let's just say we're going to look at this one in Washington. I haven't even looked at any of these yet. So these are different ones for me. Beautiful location, like gorge, right? So, so pretty. And of course we'll take a look and see what is the booking? So this one's booked up pretty well. You can kind of see that it, they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 roughly days booked up in March. That's a really good sign that shows you that the property is likely booked up pretty well. So I'll look at that and I will also look at, again, the cleaning fee because I think that is an important piece. And I will look at reviews as a whole. So this is kind of how I'm starting to look at the landscape to see what's normal and how you can possibly differentiate your pro project from other projects. Once you have this information, you are officially ready to go run your scenarios. So here is what a scenario looked like for us when we were first getting in that planning process. So this is for our dome, Cascade Dome. Our lot was $35,000. We built a sauna for $7,000. This is the peak lumber hike. So all of the decking materials and all of that kind of wood and stuff is about two thirds, one third to two thirds higher than it should be on a normal basis. But you know, we just decided to build during a lumber hike, because why not? It's what we like to do, we're idiots. So we've got walkways, engineering, um, we've got all kinds of stuff, but basically the important piece is you can see the all-in costs, including our lot, were about $75,000. What's important to note here is this does not include $400 a month that we were spending on gas to go back and forth. We were in the car eight hours every single weekend, just commuting to get more supplies to work on the project, it was a bit of a pain in the butt. Also important to note, we did all of the work ourselves. And so that is definitely reflective in the price. If you hire this out, you're probably looking at another 30 to 50% higher. It's insane. And we are also missing some of our 2022 expenses. I'm a little bit behind on my bookkeeping, so I gotta figure that out. Okay, so then you plug in your nightly rate. Now from there, I like to run three different scenarios. I like to see my best case, my mid case, and my worst case scenario, so I can see what I might be able to expect. And if I can make the worst case scenario work from a financial standpoint, then I know that I'm golden. So what I like to assume is a best case scenario is 80% occupancy. You really never want to be 100% because what that entails is that if there's any issues, if the bed gets broken, if you have to replace a coffee maker, like whatever, you don't necessarily have time to get in there and do maintenance on your property. So you just want to be careful too about using 100% for your occupancy rate. It's really not very realistic. 60% is about average. That's what I would usually plug in and I think most people can probably expect over time. Hey there, heavy breather, my pup. <laughs> and then the worst case scenario is about 50%. Now these are just averages that I have seen based on the research that I did, but I like to plug in that there's 12 months rentable and that gives you your total days rented, your TDR it tells you roughly how many days you might be rented in each of these different scenarios. And then you come across the potential revenue. Now, before you get excited, I want you to pause and remind yourself that revenue is not profit. You have expenses, you have taxes, you have all kinds of other things that are gonna be coming out of that. So that is not truly how much money you will be making, that's just your revenue. 
I also like to factor in that most guests would stay an average of two nights. And so why that's important is because when you factor in your expenses, I like to think through the consumables, like the coffee, the hot chocolate, the s'mores kits, the firewood, uh, essential oils, like stuff like that is really helpful to know how much it might cost you. And so I like to factor in $10 per stay in order to cover that. Snow plowing, I estimated high. I had no idea what was normal. It's, this is my first property in a really, really snowy climate, so I really didn't know what was normal. I also budgeted in a little bit for marketing. Notice that my utilities are zero because we're off the grid. What I did forget, and I definitely did, is the porta potty rental. So that was something that I did not include, so this would probably cover that. It's about $160 to $180 per month. So that gives you an idea. And I also forgot to include insurance. That for us is about, oh shoot, I think it's $1,500 a year. So it's pretty reasonable. We pay that quarterly. And then from there, you can see how much money you might actually make. Of course, we factored in some taxes. I factored in taxes at 20%. That could be a little bit low. If you wanna be extra conservative, go for 30 and then it gives you an idea of what your profit might be. Now, if you look at the profit and you think, okay, I might make $14,000 off of this property on the low end with a little bit of work to get it booked up. If you're okay with that, that's awesome. But you have to remind yourself that it's costing you about $75,000 in order to generate $14,000 a year. Is that worth it? That's up to you to decide. I personally thought it was. And so when I was running my calculations and my numbers, I thought if I make even $12,000 in profit per year, that's pretty dang good and I'd be a happy camper. The next piece is when you have that budget figured out, I want you to add 20% to the cost because there is stuff that comes up. Lumber hikes, for example, was not something that I expected. You're also going to have insurance that wasn't included in these projections. I'm a little bit smarter now. I know what to expect with that. So all of these things, you wanna make sure that you're adding at least 20% into your budget and probably 20% into your projections to make sure that you are kind of covering your ass on both sides. Is that the tech? That's the technical term. And then you're going shopping, which for some people is the most stressful part and for some the most exciting. The way that you shop for this law is you start with what can you afford? This is based on the financing, the conversations you've been having with credit unions and banks. Super important to start there first. And then you're going to look at what are utilities that are close by. For us, it was important to have access to utilities, but it wasn't important to can do. But if it's not close by, it wasn't the end of the world for us at this moment. The other thing too is to avoid HOAs. This is kind of common sense, but HOAs will immediately shut down your GLAMP site and prevent you from even doing that in most instances. They might even have restrictions against short-term rentals, so you have to do your homework to see if that area even allows what you're trying to do. Another piece, if you're having a really hard time finding lots, what I usually recommend is having a listing agent pull expired listings and going through those. Sometimes you can find some really good deals and they didn't sell for whatever reason. And so you could reach out to those specific people or have your agent reach out to those people and you can make them a direct offer on their lot. You can just say, hey, I love this lot. I noticed it didn't sell. Are you still interested in selling? I'm interested in making an offer. Good way to go, win-win, and you can get some deals that are a little bit more off the market. And of course, when you're shopping for your lot, if you're trying to do a glamping site, I need you to go and talk to the county or the city, depending on where that lot is. The county and the city can immediately shut down your operation. So you wanna make sure that you go talk to them and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking of doing. What are some of the things, like is this allowed? What would I need to do to make this work? That stuff is so important because they can immediately shut your business down before you even get started. Again, I'll talk about that county permission piece in another video, because that is something that we had to go through as well as getting county permissions through a, what's called a conditional use permit. So I will talk about that in another video and share kind of our application and what we included in that to get this approved for us. Now this is by no means comprehensive, but it gives you at least somewhat of an idea of what you need to be paying attention to if you want to start a glamping geodome site yourself. But if you like the content, the greatest compliment you can do is subscribe and leave a comment down below. Thank you so much. We'll see you.